as The Money Burns is an original podcast by Mickey Woodard. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hits. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is a narrative story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary, emotional, and personal connections. Story Recap Louise Van Allen has finally married Prince Alexis Devani, while Barbara Hutton bows at Buckingham Palace and dances with the Prince of Wales. Now back to As the Money Burns. After Taste Many things can happen inside a garden. Will another royal romance bloom? Or forbidden fruit prove too tempting? Section 1. Story Teen heiress and chubby budding fashionista Barbara Hutton has accomplished so much since her debutante ball back in December 1930. Her grand event has brought her plenty of attention, both positive and negative. And now she has bowed in front of the King and Queen of England and met the dashing Prince of Wales. Her fairy tale life is finally coming true. Before her arrival in London, Barbara learned the official news that her best friend Sylvia de Rivas de Castilla de Guzman has announced her pending nuptials to Count Henri de Castellan, son of Count Stanislas de Castellan, for June. Barbara tried so hard to reunite Sylvia with her lover, Prince Alexis Divani, to no avail. However, now Barbara has her own burgeoning romance to fill the void. While traveling overseas, the ardent, dangerous playboy, millionaire, Phil Plant snuck aboard to continue his wooing of Barbara. Just like the storybook romances she so devotedly consumed, Barbara is swept up in the idea of love, knowing full well that Phil needs to reform his bad boy ways. Phil promises to give up drinking and carousing to become a suitable mate. Arriving later in London, her father Franklin Hutton rushes to ensure that his daughter does not make a foolish decision. Also arriving in London on their honeymoon, the newlyweds Prince Alexis Divani and the newest Princess Divani, Louise Van Allen, quickly hit the town as the prince reestablishes his nightlife and social life with a sizable bank account. Maybe Louise should have paid more attention to the fates of her sister-in-laws, May Murray, and the now ex-princess Divani, Pola Negri. Phil Plant isn't a prince, but he has plenty of capital and ties to Broadway and actresses. Playboys often have trouble reforming their ways, but for the sweet and lovable Barbara, Phil makes a solid, sincere pledge. Still, there's another semi-playboy within Barbara's sights. The Dev's delight and supreme catch of all time. Not only a prince, but a future king. Correction, THE king. King of England and Great Britain, Emperor of India, and plenty more titles to come. After her Court of St. James debut, she danced with David, the Prince of Wales. He is light on his feet and far adept in all styles and manners of dancing. He's a jazz aficionado and great at the foxtrot. His athletic prowess includes polo. He is witty, charming, and good-looking. He's a little petite, but Barbara is tiny herself. All her former Farmington classmates and the upper-class debutantes who so repeatedly have snubbed her for all her wealth are surely seething with envy. Barbara wistfully gazes in the mirror thinking of the crown on her head, the fabulous jewels, adoration, glamour, and most of all, true love. Could it be possible that this chubby little teen might have two suitors and one so highly eligible vying for her attention? Of course, a romance with the handsome and sophisticated David, the Prince of Wales, crosses her mind. Barbara would love nothing more than to be a princess, an actual princess, and with him, she would even become a queen. But more realistically, she has a burgeoning romance with the dangerous playboy Phil, He, too, is a bit older and divorced from silver screen star Constant Bennett. Vicariously, this makes Barbara feel as beautiful and glamorous as the Hollywood starlet. He also comes with a sizable inheritance in his own right. Both men make wonderful suitors as they would marry for love and not her money. At 3 p.m., the garden party begins and Barbara arrives a tad late. She walks again the Buckingham Palace grounds marveling at its grandeur while also assessing its value. This is not the Royal Garden event that will close the London season at the end of July. 
Today's event is a little smaller in scale, so Barbara will make the most of being closer to the prince amongst 2,000 guests. The fragrant and beautiful grounds are filled with flowers and cloth tables. Ladies walk around wearing bright colors in the attempt to set new fashion trends. In a brightly colored green dress, as is the color this season, Barbara accessorizes with a large brim bowler hat, parasol, and black gloves. She loves all the endless details. Eventually, Barbara finds herself in an intimate circle with Prince David. He has spent the last 10 years traveling the world. He did the first photo safari of Africa only the year before. Oh, how Barbara would love to go on such adventures. Though it is mid-afternoon, the prince is already a tad tipsy. In the group is the sophisticated Lady Furness, a Viscountess in rank and an American by birth, Thelma Morgan, whose twin sister is Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt. Thelma is never too far away from the prince. She even traveled on the African safari trip with him and her husband. The trio are often seen together, and David is a frequent honored guest of the couple. Back at her hotel room, Barbara runs into Phil, leaving disappointed. He does not speak to her as he jumps into his waiting roles. Barbara enters to see her smug father, Franklin, pouring himself a drink. He informs her that the young lover's engagement is over. She is a minor under his protection. Her father is trying to protect her from an errant playboy who will only break her heart if so lucky, and not her physically. Crushed, Barbara heads out for a night at the embassy club made ultra-fashionable by the patronage of the Prince of Wales. There, she joins his entourage and notices more the prince drinking heavily. When they dance, he regales her with gossip and bemoans the tediousness of royal life. At a distance, she spots an inebriated Phil dancing with another glamorous starlet. He has readily replaced Barbara in the blink of an eye. Another day and night of heartbreak, Barbara returns to her suite of rooms, now alone to drown in her thoughts of sorrow. If Phil is truly gone, then what hope will she ever have of finding real love? Her devoted governess and substitute mother figure, Tiki, approaches her and slides over a book. Barbara picks it up when an envelope falls out. Recognizing the unmistakable stationery, she tears into it curiously and reads, a letter of friendship. She grabs a pen and pours her heart out in a poem. The next morning, Barbara's bags are packed as her father, Franklin, and stepmother, Irene, head over to France for better distractions and hopefully more idealistic romantic pairings. Heading in another direction, Phil hops on another ocean liner and sails to India to mend his broken heart. Forbidden fruit may be sweet, but can quickly turn bitter and spoil. Section 2, History and Historiography Titles have long been used to indicate status and power, coveted by many that aspired to heights larger than their origins or present circumstances would indicate otherwise. One of the most prominent, prestigious, and longest-running titles in the world is the Prince of Wales. During the post-Roman era, the most powerful Welsh ruler was considered the King of Britons that eventually morphed into the title Prince of Wales used as the equivalent of the title King during the 12th and 13th centuries. Originally, the title was given to native Welsh princes until the 12th century. The last of those Welsh-only rulers, known as Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, his wife, Eleanor de Montfort, was the first Princess of Wales as well as Lady of Snowdon. Eleanor died in childbirth while Llewellyn died in battle, both in 1282. A different Llewellyn the Great ruled under the title of Prince of North Wales. On his death in 1240, the title would be passed on to his younger and legitimate son, Dafid ap Llewellyn, the Prince of Gwynedd, a Welsh kingdom and a Roman Empire successor state. The title would be shortened to Prince of Wales in the first time used for a ruler in 1244. The title would pass on to his nephews until the line ceased in 1283. As heir apparent to the British or English throne, King Edward I bestowed the title onto his son, Edward of Carnarvon, in 1301. The next time the title was given in 1343 by King Edward III to his son, Edward of Woodstock, also known as the Black Prince. The origin behind the Black Prince nickname is unknown, but theoretically derived from either wearing a black shield and armor or earned for a brutal reputation, especially during battles against the French and Aquitaine. When the Black Prince died before ascending the throne, the title passed on to his brother, Richard of Bordeaux, 
in 1376, who became King Richard II in 1377. Another notable Prince of Wales, Henry VIII, took over the title after his brother Arthur Tudor's death. Until most recently, Queen Victoria's son, Albert Edward, who became King Edward VII, was the longest title holder at 59 years and 45 days. Prince Charles has had the title for 63 years and 300 plus days and ongoing. The Prince of Wales title can only be given to the heir apparent and thus someone unable to be displaced in the line of succession. It is strictly considered as male and primogenitor in nature. However, the title is not hereditary nor automatic. It must be given by the reigning monarch. An heir apparent is any person who cannot be removed and will inherit whatever title, role, property, or whatever as long as that person outlives the preceding property holder. An heir presumptive is someone who can be displaced if a birth of a near heir occurs prior to the property holder's death, i.e. in most European monarchies the heir apparent is the eldest child. However, in the past that primarily meant male heirs above females, such as King Henry VIII's son, Prince Edward, also assigned the title Prince of Wales upon birth, became King Edward VI, and succeeded to the crown prior to his elder sisters, Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth I, both who later went on to reign by default after their younger brother's death. There have been times with no Prince of Wales. Princess Elizabeth was heiress presumptive, but not the Princess of Wales. After David King Edward VIII, the next Prince of Wales was Prince Charles, who did not automatically get the title upon birth, nor his mother's ascension to the throne, but received it in 1958 when he was nine years old. There has been no official Princess of Wales as heiress apparent. Generally, the title Princess of Wales is for the wife and future queen consort, Technically, Camilla automatically has the title with her marriage but has chosen not to use it publicly due to the lingering association with Diana. With a new succession law, the first female heiress apparent eligible would be Princess Charlotte only if her brother, Prince George, passes away. Related to getting the title, the second most important duty as the future king is finding an appropriate wife and ensuring the continuing line of succession. As most of us are aware, in British law, anyone up to the sixth in line of succession must get approval of their potential spouses to marry. This is incredibly even more important for those who will directly inherit the throne. And here is where David, King Edward VIII, was long a concern for the crown. One year before his succession, Fraser Hunt published the biography The Bachelor Prince, which discusses the need for the prince to find a wife and marry. If he fails at this, even if he gets the throne then his niece, Princess Elizabeth, will become the future queen. At that time, Elizabeth was only nine years old. According to Lady Colin Campbell in several videos, David was one of the most popular Prince of Wales. Queen Victoria's son, Albert Edward, was also highly popular and set fashion trends like the dinner jacket. He married at age 21 to Alexandra of Denmark. Already at age 36-37, David's long bachelorhood might have added to his appeal like how the supposed singlehood, availability of rock stars and movie stars enhances the various what-if daydreams and possibility of a romance for any fan. Only David had little interest in young available ladies, preferring married women instead. By the way, in January 1931, he met Wallace Simpson at a party thrown by his current married mistress, Viscountess Thelma Morgan Furness. On June 10, 1931, Wallace Simpson will be presented to his parents, King George V and Queen Mary, as part of the fourth court of debutantes and some married ladies that year. This will be unrelated to Wallace having a romantic relationship with the prince, which will not really occur until 1934. Now, when discussing the prince who became King Edward VIII, only to abdicate for love, then known as the Duke of Windsor, modern biographies all too readily mention his prior indiscretions which would not have been so boldly published prior to his abdication. There are at least three biographies in my review on David before his succession. By the way, his full name is Edward Albert Christian George Andrew Patrick David. In public and as a prince, he might be referred as Edward primarily, but in private and by family and close friends, he is David. One book refers to David, the other Edward, and so on, ever alternating depending on perspective. As a naval officer after World War I, David loses his virginity to a prostitute in Paris. From 1917 to 1918, he will quickly become embroiled in a passionate affair with the well-known courtesan Marguerite Alibert, and writes her several letters both sexually explicit and candidly criticizing his royal family. 
A few years later, in 1923, Marguerite Ali Bear is charged with murder of her husband, Prince Ali Kamal Fami Bey of Egypt at the Savoy Hotel in London. After seeing the opera The Merry Widow, they had a fight and she shoots him in self-defense. She faces a sensationalistic trial where she details all sorts of abuse and exploitation by her husband, much of which others dispute or side-eye due to her quite lengthy previous sex worker history. It is now known she also used the letters by the infatuated Prince of Wales as blackmail and leverage to be found acquitted of the charges. More letters would later resurface upon her death as she always kept them as insurance. They would then be destroyed after her death. By the way, as mentioned in episode 4, Wonderful Things, Prince Ali's death is listed as part of King Tut's curse that fell on the first set of people who entered the tomb in 1922. David would go on to have affairs with several married women, Frida Dudley Ward, Thelma Morgan Furness, and Wallace Simpson. Speculation is that he liked more domineering and nurturing women as well as he never truly wanted the throne. In contrast, there are several instances indicating he did indeed wanted to keep the throne, but not under the terms of the law. According to John F. Kennedy, forbidden fruit tastes sweet, but its aftertaste is bitter. Royal and privileged lives can be quite messy, and the heart wants what it wants. Love, money, power, status, all elements that do not always play well together. Section 3, Contemporary and Personal Relevance. Near misses are a funny thing in so many ways. Have you ever noticed how people like to recalculate a moment in complete totality as all positive or all negative? I mean, we all have nostalgic moments filled with what ifs. It can be a little amusing and frustrating to think you might have solved all your worldly problems if you had only made one decision differently. Inherently ignoring at that moment, it didn't feel completely right. Also ignoring that there's a whole host of many more choices and paths one must go through to have that fairy tale ending promised in those nice and tidy stories. Well, the concept of being a princess in real life has plenty of modern examples that it might not be all that we dream. Most prevalently, the most beloved princess of memory, the People's Princess, Diana, the Princess of Wales. A young 19-year-old kindergarten teacher becomes engaged with the world's most eligible bachelor, Charles, the Prince of Wales. Their grandmothers had collaborated to bring on the match. Charles had previously flirted with Diana's older sister and had a failed relationship with Camilla Shand, who married Andrew Parker Bowles, himself a former paramour of Charles's sister, Princess Anne. Prince Charles and Diana had an elaborate wedding, and according to different sources, the first two years went fairly well when everything started falling apart. Diana would later complain about the royal restrictions and the lack of love and romance from her husband. Both would end up having affairs, Charles with his former girlfriend and now current wife Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall. After their divorce, Diana was allowed to keep the moniker Diana, Princess of Wales. The reference of princess before a name is reserved for a natural-born princess or when accompanying the titled spouse. Of course, this also affects the rules of curtsy, bowing, firsties, and countless other situations that seem trivial for commoners, foreigners, and non-royal supporters. Their first son, Prince William, who might one day soon enough become the Prince of Wales, married Catherine Middleton, who has taken her time adjusting to royal life. Second son, Prince Harry, and his American wife, Meghan Markle, had a much harder time adjusting and left royal life with less than two years in 2020 for private entrepreneurship. According to Lady Colin Campbell, there is now speculation that the former royals are trying to usurp and claim the title surname of Wales preemptively before it will be passed officially on to Prince William. At a public event, the former royals were referenced by the surname Wales, as the unmarried sons of Prince Charles, William and Harry were both referred with the surname Wales during their time in college and the army, and in public as Prince William or Harry of Wales. But upon marriage, their duke titles became their surnames and public title. This is by law and long-standing codified tradition. The official Prince of Wales title must be ordained by the reigning monarch to the heir apparent and not automatically hereditary. If and when Prince William officially becomes the Prince of Wales, his three children will have of Wales added to their names. Ugh, so many endless tedious details. Kind of slightly dampens the fairy tale idea of being a princess is all about glamour and pampering. 
a lesson our American dollar princesses will learn soon enough, especially when their royal spouses come without true sovereignty nor money-generating estates. When the hour strikes, carriages turn back into pumpkins, luxurious garments might become rags, and tower-like imprisonment await for some of our heirs and heiresses. We are one week away from the Trooping the Color balcony ceremony for Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee celebrating her 70 years of service on the throne on Thursday, June 2, 2022. Next month, we will have one royal story involving her grandmother, Queen Mary, and Wimbledon that will surely delight. So stay tuned and click like, subscribe, or whatever else reminder to keep you informed. Next, when we return to As the Money Burns, stakes are high in various sports and competitions, but the highest stakes come in the game of marriage. Rivals beware. Until then. As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Water based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As The Money Burns via Good Pods, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com.